The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. John was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard what he said and followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following him and said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and you will see. So they went and saw where Jesus was staying, and they stayed with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, was one of the two who heard John and followed Jesus. He first found his own brother Simon and told him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated Christ. Then he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You will be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The Gospel of the Lord. My brothers and sisters in Christ, welcome back to Ordinary Time and the Green Vestments. It's not called Ordinary Time because it is plain or without significance, but because it does not deal with specific events in the life of Jesus, but is focused more on his ministry, his teachings between the great event of his birth at Christmas and the passion, death, and resurrection of the Lent and Easter seasons. Today's first reading in the gospel show us that we're all called by God. The reading from Samuel reminds us of two aspects of these callings. One, that God frequently comes to us when we don't expect it and in ways that we don't expect. And secondly, we must be ready to answer to the call of God through his son, Jesus Christ, just as Samuel did. And we must speak and say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. To answer in this way, though, we must be willing to listen. In order to listen, we must find quiet time with God. And as with the prophet Elijah, it may be just in that still, small voice that God calls us. In the gospel, we see the very first evangelist for Christ, John the Baptist, leading his disciples to the Messiah. Then... Andrew immediately goes and evangelizes his own brother, Simon. They both heed the call to follow Christ without reservation. This gives us a great example of not only how to follow the call of Christ, but also to share it with others, even if it comes at a great cost to ourselves. John was willing to lose all his disciples and eventually lost his life for Jesus. The apostles left everything to follow him. Following Christ may not be easy, but the rewards are out of this world. It is the way to eternal life. At the end of the gospel, the scene turns to Simon, whose name is changed by Jesus to Cephas. Remember that in salvation history, name changes were very important. In the Old Testament, Abram had his name changed to Abraham. Jacob, his name to Israel. The name change went along with leadership or a point of change in salvation history. So too with Cephas, which we are told means Peter, but in Aramaic also means rock. Peter is the apostle that is singled out for a change of name due to his future preeminence among the apostles. He is an important part of salvation history. He is a rock upon which Jesus will build his church, the one holy, catholic, and apostolic church. It is the same church that we are become members of through our baptism. And just by this baptism, we are called just as Samuel and Andrew. And we are to share this great calling with others using John the Baptist as our model. If we look at the second reading, Paul admonishes Christians 
to avoid immorality. This advice is needed as much, if not more, today than it was in Corinth, even though Corinth at the time of Paul was known to be a very decadent society. We only have to look at the Harvey Weinstein scandal in Hollywood and all the fallout from there to see that the wisdom and teaching of Christ is not only timeless, but needed today as much as ever. Socially acceptable is not the same thing as right in the eyes of God. As Christians acting morally, we should stand out. We should be different. Holy Mother Church teaches us temperance as one of the four cardinal virtues, prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance. A virtue is a habitual inclination to do good. To become a habit, it requires continual practice. Remember that the goal of life is to make it to heaven. Our actions either lead us towards heaven or away from it. By practicing virtue and making them our habits, we will ensure that we are moving towards our ultimate goal. The alternative is the reality of hell. Temperance is the virtue that moderates the desire for pleasure, particularly those of the flesh. It helps us to moderate our appetites and control our passions. It leads us to sobriety, self-control, and modesty. Modesty is a virtue in which one controls inward and outward appearances and actions according to one's state in life. Modesty involves patience, decency, and discretion. It helps to protect the center of the person. It helps us to remain pure in heart as we hear about in the Beatitudes. It helps to protect our soul. Usually when we think of modesty, dress comes to mind. It is important what a person wears. We are how we dress. Keep in mind also that we're all members of the one body of Christ through his church, as Paul reminds us today. And our actions should not lead or tempt another person to sin. We are here to help each other gain salvation, not to be a distraction. Today in society and in fortune, even in some masses, immodest dress is rampant. If a woman, young or old, wears clothes that cause a man to lust, she too has committed sin. That may be the small spark that ignites the flame that leads him down the road to perdition. Modesty should inspire the way one dresses. It has been defined as refusing to reveal that which should be concealed. The body is sacred, as St. Paul again reminds us today. It is a temple of the Holy Spirit, and that is why we cover it modestly. A definition that fits the Catholic idea of modesty is at a minimum, Modest dress covers the thighs to the shoulders and everything in between. But modest doesn't mean frumpy. One can dress beautifully and still be modest. Modesty in dress also has a component that it is proper for our state in life and for the specific occasion. This would include coming to church, especially the holy sacrifice of the Mass. The Lord of the universe is present. What should the proper dress be for such an occasion? How would you dress if you were invited to dinner with the president at the White House? I would suggest we should dress at least that well to come before God. Your dress for mass should be at least the best you dressed all week. There's nothing more important than the holy sacrifice of the mass. It should be your Sunday best. We are here to glorify God, to receive him body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist, and our dress should reflect this. Another aspect of modesty is inaction, and this would include, especially for men, modesty of the eyes. As Jesus said, if a man looks lustfully at a woman, he has already committed adultery in his heart. It is not okay to fix our gaze on anything lustfully. It is a sin that can lead to a habit not of virtue, 
but a repetitive vice, as is seen in the all too frequent sin of pornography. The virtuous man looks away from temptation and vice and averts his eyes habitually. He makes it a habit of avoiding the near occasion of sinning with his eyes. Again, the task grows harder and harder as our society slides into decadence. Take television as an example. I would say in many cases it would be better to turn it off completely than to allow it to desensitize our eyes and through them desensitize our souls to immorality. Again, socially acceptable does not mean right in the eyes of God. Fortunately, we have been given grace from God and the sacraments of Holy Mother Church to help strengthen us in our daily struggle and grow more virtuous day by day. In doing so, we will be countercultural. We will be different, and it will be hard at times. But if we glorify God with our bodies, as St. Paul asks us to, then we are, by the grace of God, moving towards being the saints that we were created to become. And that is the good news of today's reading.